Hey everyone, and welcome to Friday Night's Facebook Live with John Deere's Embroidery Legacy. And that sounds really nice to say, Friday. I'm so happy. My wife is happy. She actually stayed. You have a you have a date tonight, don't you, Jennifer? I do. Yeah, with some ladies, which is good for me. Uh, but she's going to be out of here as soon as this is over. So we won't try to make. We'll try not to make it too too long. But let us know where you're uh, checking in from, where we are seeing you guys from. Anybody uh, posting where they're at? Yes. Awesome. We got Australia. Awesome. We Australia. Welcome. Michigan. Michigan. Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, welcome. Australia. Another Pennsylvania, Australia, Pennsylvania. Mississippi. Mississippi. Alabama. Can you spell that really quickly? <laughs> Am I <laughs> Okay. Well, welcome everybody, and uh, we got some really cool stuff we're going to do today. I am going to uh, show you guys the copper tone soa. If you were present at the last Facebook Live, give us a little little hearts or a thumb up that was last week and we had a really cool announcement about being uh, official ZSK uh, dis not distributors but partners so that was our big announcement last week we got another one today uh, but if you were there do we have any little thumbs up coming up that people were here last week I have okay. a delay you have a delay okay the reason why I ask is Jennifer and I uh, Lots. Okay. Awesome. We had a little thing happening last week where she said, you know, you're going to sew that out. And I said, yes, I will. And she said, sure, you will. Does and does anybody, does anybody? Yeah. Okay. Anyways. And I said, I was going to do it tomorrow. And then I revised. I said, no, I'll do it on uh, Monday. Well, I did get it done just so you know, but I got it done yesterday. So I am a, a little bit of a procrastinator, but the question that I have just for fun for you guys is, how many of you have been married for 10 plus years? Give me a little thumbs up if it's 10 plus years. And if you're giving thumbs up, how about 20 plus years? Okay. Now I'm in the, and I'm very thankful to say this, the 30 plus years category. Thumbs up. Okay. And if you're 40 years, thumbs up. We've got some laughing faces. We have some laughing faces. <laughs> At 50 years, if you have 50 years, that means that you have served two consecutive life sentences. That's what that really means. So I, I had my first life sentence down. I'm working on my second. But Jennifer and I, we are, uh, I mean, she's the love of my life. We've been together forever. I mentioned, you know, she was 15. I was 17 when we met. And I do have to admit that being married is all about uh, compromise. And, uh, you know, give me more thumbs up if you agree with that. We, we, Carol says to one person, to one, yeah, <laughs> yes, well, it's lots and lots of compromise and it's good because if you want to have a successful marriage, it is all about compromise and it's about learning how to coexist together because I'm an only child and I was raised by my mother and my grandmother and I was a little bit of a spoiled rotten brat, just a tiny little bit. Uh, and my wife is a country girl. She grew up with, you know, this huge family and there was, they bred like rabbits up in the Northern country. No, just kidding. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble on this one, but we were, we are, and we're polar opposites and I've gotten better. I'm not as much of a messy slob as I used to be, but I've learned to adapt and I, I do things that I never would have done before like putting toothpaste caps on top of toothpaste, uh, all that. And now I even have it further because now they have the little lids that go over the toothpaste so that you don't lose the cap. But I've learned that there's even some tricks with that because I didn't know that it was expected that I needed to regularly wipe off the toothpaste off the flip lid that goes on top because that could be an issue. And one little pet peeve that I know about is I have this habit of taking off my socks and I don't fold them the right way until you get them into the laundry hat. This has nothing to do with embroidery, guys. I'm sorry, but I, I just, you know, I had to fold them. Well, I got to be honest, that's almost too much for me. You know, I, asking me to fold them the right way before they go into the laundry because they're just going to be washed. So we had this little thing going back and forth and I learned something really cool. It's a time saving trick. OK, I learned that I can just throw them in any way I want. And when they come back, they're no longer folded the right way. They're inside out. But if I actually wear them inside out, so they're a little fuzzy on the outside and I go for my jog and I come back, when I take them off, they're the right way. So either way, it's a win-win. Uh, am I getting any thumbs up? Okay. Anyways, I, I talked a little bit. <laughs> okay. Anyways, uh, but it, it is all about compromise and it is all about working at a marriage and working at success. success. And I'm, I'm kind of saying that because I started off last week talking about finding some old designs that we had uh, many years ago. 
and I found literally thousands and thousands of old designs that I digitized commercially. As we do more of these, I'll dig into some other really cool ones. But the one that I did find, which was the copper tone design. So here's the copper tone. I did actually colorize it because the issue we had, and I'm going to go to my share screen here for a second. Be patient, guys. Uh, the issue we had with this was that uh, it didn't exactly look good when it was in its original colors. So this was a DST file right here. Hopefully you guys can all see this on screen. There we go. And that is a DST file. So it means that all the colors are just default colors that are there. And Jennifer didn't think that that really looked like a dog. And that was the issue. So I did colorize it. Well, wait, it wasn't an issue for me. But... Okay, it wasn't an issue for you? People say, okay. And I, I must admit, it looks like a pretty straggly dog. But you have to remember that that's not reality. That's not the size. The size is much smaller. That's what it looks like at the actual size. So here it is colorized. And now hopefully you can see that it does look like more of a dog. You can actually see the little bit of the white in the eyes and you can see the white in the eyes of the copper tone girl. So here is why you need to have every single color in whatever palette you currently use. And I've said that over and over again for years, but having all of the colors for any uh, design is really, really important. Now I gotta stop sharing the screen and we'll go back to here because I'm gonna show you guys the sample. And let's go to full screen, there we go. Uh, so here is the actual design sewn out. I put it up here and it is pretty tiny. So if I look at this and just to give you an idea, there's my hand right there and you can actually see the little design. But if I get up really close to it and I'll try not to, and there it's kind of coming into focus, you can actually see that it does look like a little dog and you can see the white in the eyes. I've always said that the life of a design, if it is an animal or a person, the life is in the eyes. And this is really kind of proving that point when it comes to something like this. So I had a small design here with very, very small details. And the most important thing is, is that it was actually digitized correctly. Meaning that when we did embroidery as a business, I got to be honest, the designs that we ran were the most important part of making money with embroidery. And if you, if any of you are, I guess, embroidery owners out there, give me some thumbs up if you'll agree with me that having a design that's actually digitized well, that is production friendly, has as few trims and jumps as possible, that is the difference between you kind of being successful or not. And that's where I kind of go back to that thing about having a healthy marriage. You know, it, it takes work and you have to train for it and all that. Many, many years. I don't think you ever stop the training, uh, but uh, well, <laughs> Jennifer, one of us doesn't. Yeah, one of us doesn't. Uh, yeah, she. I'll be. I'll be completed at some point. I'll, I'll be perfect at some point. Um, uh, Jesse says maybe you might want to mention that that design was done when you were doing commercial. Yes, that design was digitized, I'm guessing, 25 plus years ago. It might even have been 30 years ago. So that design was done commercially. We used to do, you know, garments, hats. We had 136 multi-heads running in production. And uh, it was a penny business. My, my grandfather who started our business when I, he wanted me to learn how to digitize because he knew that having somebody in the family who would do it would make sure that we would actually be profitable because if your machine runs, you actually make money. If you save even 500 stitches on a design and you reduce the amount of trims to like even five trims, that actually equals like 600 stitches with having five less trims on a design. So it was really, really important that we actually did our designs properly. And to this day, we digitize designs that I think are production friendly, even though I know most of you are, you know, potentially home embroiders, but you still know when a design runs well or not. Now, speaking of that, I did uh, have a person in our Facebook group, one of our groups, uh, posted a design. Is somebody saying something? Okay, okay. Jennifer's going to be interrupting me because I've said a whole lot that uh, I'm sure people are going to be hammering me for later. Anything, Jen? Uh, Katie's husband says to make sure to say thank you. She's bought all the colors of Madeira. All the colors, yes. <laughs> you know what? And that I tell people that in classes sorry, for Katie's yeah, husband. Sorry, but in all the classes for years and years, I would always tell people whatever your thread choice is, whether it's Madeira or Floriani or Robeson Anton or whatever it is, you should buy every single color because 
having the right colors in a design can make or break the design. And especially when you're choosing all of these shades. I mean, if the shades are off on that dog or on that little girl, you're going to see it. It's going to be really abrasive. So it is really, really important. Now, back to what I was saying is we had somebody who uh, does run an embroidery business and they submitted a design and uh, they asked some questions on our group. You know, what would you do differently to make this design so out? And I saw it and I had a, a bunch of stuff that I would have done differently. So I wanted to uh, get permission and do this design and show us as an example. And no way am I putting down the person who digitized this because we all are learning, uh, but I am gonna pretty much do things the polar opposite. And we're gonna turn this into a learning experience for, for everybody. So this is the actual design. I'm gonna go share my screen again and I'm gonna bring up my software. Here's the software I'm gonna share and we should be back up on our page. Now, this is the design in question right here, I believe, let's see. Yes, okay. Now this is the design, I'm gonna to go to full screen and you can see that it's a four color design and there's actually the uh, heart in the center and then there's lettering on the other side. Now, the first thing I, I did notice because I had them send me the EMB, which is the native file format. I noticed that the lettering actually was a uh, lettering font that is built into the software in, in Hatch. And if you aren't a Hatch owner, the fonts within Hatch actually are a good thing because they're object-based. They actually join together at the closest point so you don't have unnecessary jumps and trims. That's why most commercial embroiderers use Wilcom for that one reason, because you save all the trims and jumps between your objects that are close enough together. Now this part here, I'm gonna zoom into this and take a closer look. This is the part that kind of concerned me because if I turn the true view on, I can see that the four colors are underneath of the heart, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but there's these really long stitches here. And my first question was, what is this going to be going on? And it was going to be going on a very stretchy knitted garment. It's gonna go on a left chest. And if it's going on left chest, that tells me that that is going to actually pull in because long stitches on knitted garments, it might actually sew and look good when you take it off and you do the finishing. But as soon as you launder that item two or three times, you're gonna see the design start to pucker. And these long stitches where you could actually slide a pin in under here, that's where you're gonna have the issue. So, I'm gonna redigitize this logo relatively quickly. This is not a digitizing class, so I'm not going to stop and slow down. I did lose my little glove here. I have to grab my little uh, glove while I'm digitizing because I have a tablet that actually has touch and pen capabilities. I'm gonna to go to my magical scale, which is six to one. If you've watched any of my education, you know I have certain ways of doing things, digitizing at certain scales. And I'm gonna do this a little bit differently because the artwork is there and I'm not gonna worry about the sequence that I digitize it in, but I do wanna make sure that under the software settings right away, cause it's on pure cotton, I'm gonna leave it there for now, but I'm gonna make sure that my apply uh, closest join, my closest point is on while I'm digitizing. Cause I'm gonna digitize this and then resequence it. So I'm gonna to go to my digitize close shape. I'm gonna choose a line. I'm gonna choose a satin stitch. I'm gonna move this out of the way and I'm going to change this line here. Uh, let's just grab this as a white color. I'm gonna grab this line here, make it 1.25 millimeters, tell it to actually have an offset on that. And now I'm gonna digitize this object here. I'm gonna put a point here. I'm gonna go around the outside relatively quickly, just following that shape and come into a straight, go back to curves. If you've taken any of my classes, you probably don't wanna hear me go, left, left, right, left, right. Give me some thumbs up if you've been there, done that. And I'm gonna hit enter. Now I can see that I have an outline for that heart. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to digitize some of these outline objects. And if I look at them, the blue is kind of underneath of the gold and the red is over top of the gold and the green is over top of the red. So I see it starting at the blue and going around. So I'm gonna do my next color. I'll just go to blue and I'm gonna do digitize open shape and I'm gonna keep the same standards on and I'm gonna start, let's say right here and I'm gonna do a point, point and I'm gonna put a small point here because then I know it's going to handle the curve properly. I can always backspace if I don't like something and then I'm going to continue to go around the outside 
and do these points right to, let's say here, and hit enter. And that's my first curve. Then I'm gonna to go to my gold and I'm gonna do this one and I'm gonna come straight across to here. Let's put a point right here. Again, I'm coming right into the uh, corner of it, coming around very quickly and go right to here and hit enter. There's my second point. Now we'll go to red and I'll just continue to go from, let's say right here, I'm under stitching a little bit, going, all, oops, I forgot to put in my one point into the corner. If you are using what this is actually called like an input C, it's a straight point. If I'm only putting one point down, I have to put a couple as I go into the corners or it won't know necessarily how to handle the corners. And I want to come right here, hit enter, and there's my next point. And now all I have to do is go to the green, which is the last color, and let's do that. And I'm gonna come right here, go straight, 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 curve, 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 curve. And if you wanna take my education, you'll hear those words over and over again. But there is all of my points in trivia. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start digitizing the fills inside. Normally, I would digitize things in order, but because I want outlines and I'm using a fixed width, it's easier for me to get all these points laid down first, and then I can use the guidelines to digitize them. So I'll go back to, let's say, the blue, and I'm going to go to digitize close shapes, but this time I'm going to choose a fill stitch, and I'm just going to go right here, and I'm going to put it on a slight angle, and I'll keep all the angles consistent as I go through, and I know I'm going to allow for my push and pull compensation, so I'm changing those angles ever so slightly, come right to this point here and hit enter. And there's my fill, hit the H key. I can change the angle so that it is actually the angle of my pull compensation. And then I can hit the escape, let's escape. And I can do the next one, which is going to be the yellow and I'll do the same thing. So I'm just coming here and I'm putting in all of these angles and doing the fills over top. Now keep in mind, we are dealing with object-based software. So I don't necessarily have to worry about the sequence that I'm doing it in because the software is automatically going to resequence it so it joins closest point when I'm done. There's my second point. Now I'm gonna do my third point. Just repeating the process here again. I can go any direction I want, come around here, go right to this point, and let's go right to here, come in, come over to this side, continue with my pull compensation, come here, hit enter, change this to a angle. That angle is actually almost perfect. And now I only have to do one more color, which it just went off screen. So let's go C to get that back. C is hotkeys. Any software program you have, it's well worth the time to learn your hotkeys. So I'm gonna come right here. Let's put a point in and go point, go all the way around to here. And let's do this one. Again, there's a straight point going curve. I'm digitizing based on the direction of the stitches with my push and pull compensation. I do see here that if I go to my H, I need to change this one to a straight because I didn't like that angle. And I'll change this angle to something like that. So it's going to be there. So now I've digitized all of these objects, but the only one I still have to do is the one around the uh, uh, inside here for the white but I'm gonna to start to resequence these right now. So I'm gonna take this one here and I'm gonna put it right here. I'm gonna take this one here and put it right here. I'm gonna take this one here and put it over here. And then I'm gonna take this one here and put it right over here. And now if you look at this, you can see all of these objects are there. And then I'm gonna take this very last one and I'm gonna put it at the bottom. So now I have all of those fills underneath with that outside. The only thing I have to do now is go back to my digitized closed shape choose my uh, fill stitch, and I'm just gonna digitize a fill. This is going to be a completely horizontal fill. Go all the way across here like this. And I'm going to come here, 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 and here, and straight across and enter. And there I have a nice fill, but the only thing I'm gonna make sure that I do, and let's go to colors instead, is I'm gonna move, actually I don't wanna go to colors, sorry, change my mind, I'm allowed to do that. I'm gonna to go to that fill stitch, not the entire color, and I'm gonna move that to number one in the order. So when I bring that there, if I look at this now, and I go to my player, it is going to sew the fill first, and I need to change the angle, so it's actually horizontal, then it's doing that stitch, that stitch, that stitch, that stitch, and it all joins closest point. So let's just change the angle of that one fill. 
I'm gonna come here and hit the H key and make sure that's horizontal. Holding the control down will do it. And then I can adjust the start and stop. So it starts at the top and starts at the bottom. So there's no split in that fill because it's sort of one solid object that looks pretty good. And then, so I don't have to redigitize that lettering all over again. I'm just gonna grab that object there and let's copy it. And then let's go back to our original object here. And then let's go in here and let's paste it. And now I can just position it where I want. Now, the only thing I'm gonna do, which I did notice is I'm going to look at the settings of this. I know it's set on pure cotton, but I'm an old school digitizer. I like to have full control of everything that I'm doing. So I'm gonna go over to the effects and I'm gonna change that from a, sorry, to the stitching. I'm gonna change that from a center run to a edge run. And now that the edge run is done, I'm gonna change it to 0.3 millimeters instead of 0.2 for pull compensation because it is going on an item that is stretchy. And then I'm just gonna grab all of these outside items here. So there's one, two, three, four, and five for the outside of the heart. And I'm gonna change all of those to an edge run as well so that I know it's gonna stitch out properly. And there I am done. I know that design is going to sew out perfectly on a wearable item that is stretchy. And the difference between this and this will be pretty substantial. Now, I did of course run a sample because the proof is always in the stitching. So let's just get out of this. Give me a second to figure out where I am. And I'm gonna stop sharing screen and I'm back. Okay, so here actually is the sample of that. I ran it both ways. And I made sure that I didn't cheat the system. By cheating the system, I mean I used probably one of the stretchiest materials that I had available. This is just like a uh, really loose knitted material and it's actually very, very thin. And I use one piece of uh, no-show mesh stabilizer, which is what I would normally do. When you're first learning, it's really important that you actually do your designs and test them on the type of item that you know it's gonna sew on because that way you know if it's actually gonna give you good results. So I'm gonna turn this the right way. And the very first one at the top is the one that was supplied. And you can kind of see that there is some puckering happening already. The one at the bottom is the one that has the uh, stitches around the outside. So this one here is the one with all the satin stitches and it just does look and lay a whole bunch better. Those really, really long stitches you got to remember that your embroidery machine, when it gets to really long stitches like that, if it is using stepper motors, which most of the machines are using, most commercial machines, you do have stepper motors, which are good because they're more powerful, but they actually do have to slow down as the stitches get longer because the sash frame has to increase the movement and to keep up and to keep the tension consistent, the machine slows down. Well, when you are dealing with shorter stitches, the machine actually runs faster. And I've told people this for years, a stitch count on a design is actually irrelevant to the production speed of it. Because some people look at stitches and say, oh, it has 5,000 stitches. If you have 5,000 really long stitches and you have 5,000 shorter stitches and you have a machine that's going to speed up or slow down based on the width of the stitch, you're gonna have completely different results. Now. We did mention actually, and I'll pull this one up. I think it's this one right here, is it? Yes, I did uh, mention last week that we are now an official partner with ZSK. And please check out the videos. I mean, we have a little thing there that you can actually take a look at this machine and we have you know some pricing and a video and everything. But the thing that I do love about this machine, and there's only a couple machines in the commercial industry that do this, they don't work on stepper motors, they work on uh, servo motors, which means that the precision and the accuracy of them is better and it's faster. It stays a consistent speed all the time and it actually does run at a lower tension with regards to the top and bottom. So you just overall get better results. So anyways, I went a million miles an hour on that. Did we have any questions regarding that? Okay. You. Yes, now that I can get a word in. Oof. Susan's asking, what's your favorite stabilizer for t-shirts? Uh, for t-shirts, I would personally say no-show mesh uh, and potentially no-show mesh fusible. Uh, I have had some situations like so there's, there's some times that people are using a lot of the, you know, uh, what do they call that? The moisture wick sweatshirts now, the ones that are really stretchy and are geared that way. Uh, there, there are some specialty stabilizers that stretch on the 
uh, horiz not the horizontal, but the from side to side. So I guess that's ver vertical or, but they stretch and then people are using that with a conjunction of a tearaway, believe it or not. And that stops it to look from, the, you know, it's puckering. You have to keep in mind that in the old days when we were using production, we didn't have all these fancy stabilizers. We really only had cutaway in different weights and we had tearaway stabilizers in different weights. That was it. And we had to make sure that we digitized in a way to compensate for the material as opposed to using stabilizers to compensate for the results. So in today's day and age, the no-show mesh products, and this is the one here, it's very thin. You can actually see my, my thumb is almost you know, partially visible through it. It's a very, very thin cutaway stabilizer. It looks like it has heat press grids in it, and it does come in fusible and non-fusible. On some stretchy items, the fusible will help you because it'll let things stay flat. But if it is a sports shirt where people are wearing it, that when it goes on the body, it actually already stretches, then that can work against you because you're you know, basically eliminating the stretch because it's being fused on while you're embroidering. Yeah, Susan said when she uses a fusible, sometimes she'll get puckering. Yes, yeah, sometimes you will get puckering. I've seen people use, uh, again, commercially, a combination of a cutaway, and I forget which one they call it. It's actually, I haven't really seen it in the home industry, but I've seen it commercially where it actually stretches on the X and it, it really does sort of mold to those moisture wick type of things. And they actually use a very thin layer of tearaway as well over uh, top of that. So it's literally a tearaway and then a stabilizer and then the very stretchy fabric. And generally you'll get really good results. I mean, here also, if you're talking commercially, uh, as soon as you start to hoop an item, and if you hoop and press that item, that hoop in the traditional way, you will actually take that material and it will stretch out slightly because of the hoops that are going in. It's like, a, you know, male and female, it's, it's pushing in, it's causing the stretch. But now with the mighty hoops and with the, uh, what's the one in the home industry now, the hoop uh, monster or magnet monster. I, anyways, I know Dime has one, but there is now hoops that are magnetic, which are almost better for that because you're not stretching the material during the hooping process. Hey, somebody else is uh, asking, find it here. Uh, would you change the middle word to stitch right to left for easier trimming? Uh, right to left, left to right. I don't think it really matters if it is a garment on how the design is actually stitching. I would probably, if the logo is here and I have lettering three, you know, three lines of lettering like I did in that design, I'd probably start from the logo out every time. So it's kind of pushing. I always look at a design so that I have to remember that it's not ink. It's not being just printed and saturated into it. There's actually tension on the top and bobbin thread. And it's going to, the, by the direction that you're sewing, it's going to almost smooth the embroidery. That's why with fills, I like to keep things in one direction as well. Okay, uh, Gail saying, how do you prevent stitches from getting too long? How do you prevent stitches from getting too long? Uh, just follow the rules. If you want theory, we do have, I guess, a cheat sheet. We have theories on stitches. I wouldn't go over seven millimeters on air, any wearable item. Okay. Yep. Cool. We good? Okay. Awesome. And how are we doing for time? Because I know you have a big day and uh, how, how far am I into the time? I get lost when I do these things. I, I could probably, it's 5.30. It's 5.30. Okay. I could talk forever and ever. If you have questions, please bring them in now. I'm going to share a couple more things with you that are really cool. I'm excited about this because we have an equally big announcement this week as we had last week. Uh, before we do that, though, I will let you know that we did release the uh, iron, which, which font was it? The iron... Anyways, this is the other one. Okay, the, uh, oh, we did Iron Rider. Sorry, is this, uh, this is Iron Horse. So for you guys who are Hatch or Wilcom users, we did a font that looks almost exactly at, like this one last week. It just had some little pieces that were on the side. This is the second part to that. This is actually on sale as well. And this is the Iron Horse font. And it comes in regular stitches, applique, two colors, and in flexi fills as well. Uh, Linda is doing a great job of posting YouTube videos on all of our glyphs and flexi fills and stuff like that. A couple of them were just released uh, this week, so check them out. 
you will be amazed at what you can do within the software with these fonts as opposed to traditional keyboard fonts that you just type in. Now, are we ready for the big announcement? We're ready. Okay. So here's the big announcement, guys. We have been working on this for a long, long time. As long as we've been working on the announcement of becoming a ZSK official partner, we also wanted to go back to our roots and we actually have a new webinar that is uh, being posted actually as we speak. I think James will put the link on it up for it, but we are doing a how to make money with embroidery webinar. And this is basically for anybody who has an embroidery machine. You do not have to have a commercial machine to start a business with embroidery. Will it probably lead to something like that? Yes, because the better the machine, the faster the output, the more money you make. It's kind of common sense. But we do have a, uh, a seminar. It's a full day seminar. This will actually be a webinar. We are not doing it alone. We actually have other guests that are appearing. And if you watch the little video that I did, we have over a hundred years of accumulated experience. I actually have a, a wonderful lady by the name of Jennifer Cox. She's actually the owner of NNEP, which is the National Network of Embroidery Professionals. And she actually uh, hosts the Embroidery March show in Georgia. Uh, she is going to be doing two um, seminars. Uh, during this, and it is going to be awesome because she's going to be giving some business hacks as well as some marketing ideas that cost under $100. We also have a good friend of mine uh, named Elnor Remtula. Elnor is the owner of Twiga Industries. He actually is a ZSK, uh, I guess, distributor in all of Canada, but he is probably the best tech that I've ever met anywhere in the world for embroidery machines. And I'm talking commercial or home. And he's going to be sharing his knowledge. And he's been in this industry 40 years. Wow. That's yeah, 40 years. I, I knew Elnor when I was a teenager. And I'd say we've kind of uh, grown older, old together. But if you look at his bio, I can't figure it out because his hair is black for the most part and mine's going gray. So I don't know how that worked. Um, but we also have some other special guests. Uh, we're going to have a special guest from ZSK that's going to talk about the innovative things that they have with their machines and their equipment. But the really special guest, and I got to make sure I do this properly. Are you guys here? Let's see if we can get them in. This is, uh, we'll see if this technology works real quick. This is Jesse and James Deere. Are you there? Hello. There we go. There we Everybody. go. Yay. All right. <laughs> and I have to put in a little. Okay. Okay. You're there, guys. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Hey. <laughs> this is actually, guys, I, you, you may have seen my sons uh, periodically, but I think this is the first time that we've actually had them both together, sitting together doing one of these. And yep. uh, they actually are both within the family business. And I am, I got to be honest, a proud papa because. My original thing for years and years, I said this over and over again, I did not want my, my children to be in this industry. And uh, I don't know why, I think it's because I kind of was forced into it. I felt like I was uh, you know, forced to be a digitizer, forced to work in it. But the day that Jesse, Jesse, put up your hand so they know who you are. Okay, the day that Jesse came to me um, after working successfully in uh, the insurance industry for a couple of years, and you were a manager in, in I guess, one of the, um, what would you call it? One of the, the offices that they had. Uh, yeah. He came and asked me if I would mentor him. And it, I, I did. I accepted humbly. And it took me about three days to tell him everything that I knew. And then he's been, uh, <laughs> he's been yeah. on his own. <laughs> Maybe but, two, but uh, no, yeah, I'm two, just okay. <laughs> yeah, exaggerating. But I got to be honest, guys, um, the world has changed very quickly. I have seen this industry develop from the Shifley days. I've done everything from retail to uh, selling stock designs, to being an educator in the commercial industry, to having cut and sew. We had 136 heads, we had Shifley machines, and I've seen this industry change, but I've seen it change faster in the last 10 years, and I've seen it change even faster in the last five months than ever before. Uh, things have definitely uh, changed. The, the whole business model is, uh, is different. And this is where I'm really thankful. I'll let you boys talk in a second, but I'm really thankful because if it weren't for my sons, I honestly don't think I'd be in business right now because they've both brought something specific to this with regards to marketing in a digital age and social media that I just don't know enough about. So 
Guys, do you want to pipe in and just share a little bit about what you'll ta be talking about in your hour-long seminar that you're going to be doing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, for myself, at least, I'm more so focused on the marketing yes. here at Embroidery Legacy. Me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the digital marketing. So uh, what I'll be doing is kind of teaching you how that kind of pertains to the modern age, how you can use that within your embroidery business. You know, face-to-face uh, -face sales definitely aren't dead. They're very important. But I'm going to kind of teach you how to tweak just a, a little bit of, uh, I guess, in terms of your website, some social media tips, things of that nature that you can really use to help excel your sales. And of course, secure more orders, which is why you'd want to be in business in the first place. Yeah. And, and James, James is the creative guy who does all of our videos. And a lot of people think that you have to, you know, start out with everything. But in reality, James, what, what do you really need to get started? Well, the, the cool thing is nowadays, everybody has a studio in their pocket. So we're going to be showing you how you can get started, uh, start a social media account and grow tons of followers and get started with your business. So. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fun. Uh, just so you know that within this how to make money seminar, it is running literally from nine to five. And there's actually eight different class slots. Uh, the boys will be doing the longest slot. It's an hour long. I didn't know if I, if you guys knew that. Everybody else is 45 minutes, but well, to <laughs> well, be we honest, do now. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> do now. But th th there's more, in my opinion, with understanding technology and marketing properly within this this new world that we found ourselves in. Having the foundation of knowing sales and you know traditional marketing is important because, as you said, Jesse, we still use that. But understanding uh, how to get started and not necessarily outsource because that can be a nightmare. I mean, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. we will, uh, we'll be focusing more so on not the advanced technical things. We want to make sure that it's easy to understand for the beginner, but also throw in some more intermediate to advanced tips for those of you who have been doing it for a while. So don't feel intimidated at all by the fact that, you know, online marketing, it's really not as scary as a lot of people think that it, it, you know, it is. Um, but yeah, we're going to start off. We're going to kind of hold your hand through the process, make it really nice and easy for you. Yeah. And being that this uh, will be shot virtually from, I think, up to four different locations, uh, James, when you're doing your time slot, you know, showing a little bit about the, the studio and having a basic setup and how you can uh, attract customers with, you know, quick video tips. I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words. And, and we've seen that in our business as well. So and the so, best part is the last session of this is going to actually be a half an hour session where we're doing a round table question and answer with all of the educators. So there will be uh, six of us and we'll have that as an open session. Uh, the other cool thing is that we will be recording this. If you can't make it, if you do sign up and you can't make it, it will be available afterwards for you to watch. It's, it's of course great if you're there because you can interact with us live and we'll have people there, uh, you know, fielding questions. Uh, but the, all of this information will remain in your classroom for one full year after this session ends, right? So, and we might do it again a year later because the way technology is changing, the, the, uh, some of the information is going to change as well, which I think will be a, a good thing. We're gonna have to grow. That's, that's one thing that I found in uh, business is that a foundation is important, but the ability to I guess going back to what I talked about with my beautiful wife, who I love with all my heart, we've had to make uh, changes and compromises along the way to adapt to both of us having a successful marriage. And it's the same thing in business. You have to be willing to change and adapt to the situation around you. So anyways, anything else, guys? Oh, I think that's about it. Uh, we look forward to seeing, you know, if you want to attend, we look forward to seeing you there and it's going to be a lot of great information. Awesome. Awesome. And we do have some great educators as well. I, I think Jennifer Deere is going to be doing a two hour long uh, class on how to train your husband. Uh, <laughs> actually, you know what, that might be the class that actually we, we have more people sign up than anything else. So anyways, uh, do we have any other questions, guys? Uh, that is kind of it, to be honest. We are really looking forward to doing that how to make money seminar. The great thing about it is if you are in a business model right now or you're thinking about making money with embroidery, I guarantee we'll give you a lot of foundation so that you will, you know, avoid pitfalls and be you know, more successful much faster than you would trying to do it on yourself. We, we have a lot of combined experience with uh, being successful embroiderers.
Any other questions, my dear? Um, uh, Janet says she had signed up for the Cleveland Sewing and she was asking, is this uh, similar to that seminar? That uh, the Cleveland missed? Sewing, uh, we did do a how to make money scheduled for that. And I had traditionally done those classes in uh, that setting. To be honest, this is going to be that times by eight because in those classes, I usually have between 45 minutes to one hour to go over some of the basics. This is going to be a lot more in depth. We will have you know, tutorials and stuff like that that you'll get within the webinar as well. And the best part is you can watch this information over and over and over again. And I'm kind of glad that it's not just me because I've done certain things in my career and I've been successful, but I got to be honest. I mean, I, I've, have I failed? Oh yeah, many times. Just, you know, we've, we've tried things and they haven't worked, but I never see a failure as, you know, failure. I see it as an opportunity to learn. So, you know, we, we will give you a lot more content in this full day webinar that I could possibly give in a one hour session. So, any other questions? Uh, more in regards to, um, is it okay to float stretchy fabric using a temp spray? Uh, is it okay to float stretchy fabric using a spray? I would say yes it is in the right situation. And to be honest, uh, I will be going over a lot of that stuff within how to make money. It isn't just about marketing. It is actually about, uh, you know, how to have effective uh, ways to be more productive. And a lot of that is floating, to be honest. A lot of people think that this idea of floating items is new, but we were floating items 25 years ago when we were cap, you know, doing cap manufacturing and we would have panels and lay them down. And depending on the item you're doing, because I know that cap manufacturing is, is more or less offshore these days, but if you are doing, you know, pre-made uh, place cover, or what do you call those things? Did, uh, things for tables, you know, small items that you wouldn't necessarily have to hoop. Placemats. Yeah, placemats, thank you. You could actually float those items using a kind of window pane mentality with certain stabilizers and also with some tack down stitches. So we will be giving tips and tricks on that as well. But yes, in certain situations, you could use a spray. So anyway, is anybody excited about the How to Make Money webinar? Give me some thumbs up. So we, we are really excited to have that one happen. It is a ways off. It's in October. And uh, keep in mind as well, for those of you who are business owners, that is a justified uh, expense right. that you can actually write off your books because it is education. And that's the key. Uh, we do a lot of that ourselves. Jesse is as good as he is because he has spent a lot of time getting educated on social media and marketing. So uh, we have people asking about the time zones and the class layout, et cetera. If you want yep. to let them know where the link is. Yeah, uh, James will be putting that link up. It should hopefully be there already. This will be on YouTube and this will be replaying on Facebook. The links will be there. We have a uh, full, actually I can go there right now just so you can see and then we will end this. I'll go to share screen. I'm gonna go right to, where is it right to here? Nope. Great bird is, we have an early bird special. Yes, and we do have an early bird special. It's actually 50% off. Okay, here it is right here. And that is the wrong one. So let's just go right here. Okay, so here actually is the page on our uh, Digitizing Made Easy site under webinars. We do have it listed on how to make money with embroidery. And it is actually a video that explains everything we're going to teach. And it does have all of the classes listed with the people who are presenting it. And if you want to, you can even see a full schedule of the classes and the timelines that are there. Uh, keep in mind, we will be doing this. Um, I think it's a central time zone. And uh, I know that that will be very early for some of you who might be in Australia or in Europe, but Again, if you can't make the entire session, you will have this entire webinar to watch afterwards uh, within your classroom. Uh, there is Jennifer and Elnor and Jesse. We got to get James' picture in there. You can tell that the uh, the older son put the bios in because he forgot to put his brother in. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you do go to our site, everything is there, 
And uh, one thing I will say is working, I, I said that I never wanted to have my children in the family business. And now to be honest, it is probably the biggest blessing of my life to have my sons in this business with us. Yeah. Jennifer has been in it for as long as I have almost. So yeah, pretty much. Are, are we good then? I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed seeing that little digitizing exercise that we did. And, uh, you know, I showed you copper tone. We'll be doing another one maybe next week. And I'll show you some other designs that we pulled from the archive. So cool. Thank you guys. Appreciate your watching.